concluding um, look at uh, Spinoza's philosophy. Reason and emotion, which gets us into his ethics, which is, after all, the title of the entire major work, even though it takes him quite a while to get to it, and um, leads us towards what um, obviously is involved uh, in terms of religious implications of his pantheistic philosophy. So um, let's refresh our minds, first of all, on the premises that he is bringing to the discussion. And I hope that by now you have these pretty clearly in mind. The um, first, of course, is his double aspect monism. There is one all-inclusive being, or substance, with at least two attributes, two that we know of. Thought seems to imply conscious organization. And... Uh, Extension, that is to say, material existence. Uh, so he understands the materiality of this one being in terms of the mechanistic science of the day. In that sense, he's a materialist. And he um, seems to be thinking of this, um, this conscious uh, intelligible organization um, on, uh, in, in some way parallel to uh, the Stoic Logos, which Philo of Alexandria had tied into Judaism and later Christian thinkers had worked on. So that you have in the totality of reality these, these two aspects, these two sides of it, as the Stoics had thought. There's the material stuff of material, basic material, elemental stuff. And there's, there's the logos structure, the, the orderedness of it, which gives it the kind of uh, structured universe that it is. Call it nature, call it God, it's one and the same thing. And at the finite level, that means, of course, that um, uh, all of what there is about all of us are simply finite moments. Uh, finite modes is the way he puts it. Finite moments in the being of the all-inclusive one. So that your present thoughts are God's clear and distinct thought, not necessarily as clear and distinct in your thinking. You see. And your present uh, bodily condition, bodily processes, are obviously a finite aspect of the overall physical cosmos. Uh, so these, this double aspect applies in both the infinite all-inclusive level and the finite particular level. I have a problem with um, understanding the, the modes. He defines yeah. modes at the beginning as changing or altering its substance. Yeah. Does that mean it's changing, um, it's in, changing from infinite to finite or something? No. Because um, he, he describes a, a finite. Yeah. Um, he speaks of modes as if they are some sort of modification. You see, as if it's some change, as you put it, taking place in the one. Uh, does the all-inclusive one itself change? No. Um, no, in this sense, that it is unchangingly the all-inclusive. Now, if it is all-inclusive, um, then there is nothing it could change into, because it includes all possibilities. What change there is takes place in the finite modes which come and go within the all-inclusive. So that your yesterday thoughts and your today thoughts are 
um, modifications because they come and go in within the overall timeless thought all inclusive you see and your bodily changes changes of position your hair falling out these are modifications at the finite level uh, whereas the all-inclusive embraces uh, the whole lot. So you, you can't say that God, the one, is changing. No. Unchangingly. One. Uh, but the changes take place in the finite um, processes, um, and it's only there that change occurs. Um, yeah, well, pick it up in terms of good and evil. Is evil within God? Is error within God? Uh, well, um, we, we saw last time uh, that for Spinoza, good and evil are both confused ideas. They're not clear and distinct ideas. They're imaginative ideas that we come up with. Uh, there is no objective correlate, no objective point of reference for what we call good or evil in reality. Okay? There's no objective reality to good as distinct from evil and evil as distinct from good. Now, similarly with error. You see, because error arises because of confused ideas to which we give assent. Assent that we think is a matter of free will, but that too is a confused idea. So everything about error is a matter of intellectual confusion on our part, which does not occur in the case of God. You see, it's only in the finite modes that there are those lacks of clarity and distinctness those confusions, those imaginations. We have three modes of thought. Opinion, imagination, reason. God has only one. Clear and distinct understanding, reason. So there's no error in God. Doesn't that mean that we can think of things that God can't? Um, except that when we do, we're not thinking of things. We're not thinking of anything if it doesn't exist, are we? We're having confused ideas. Ideas are passing thoughts. They're not things. There's only one thing being substance. That is God. Yeah. So if you have some erroneous idea about some finite things, you are simply fuzzy in your thinking about God. Because any finite thing is a finite mode of God. Uh, so your errors are simply your confusion about the one substance, and its attributes and modes. Yeah. Ruth? Virtuous action, sort of survival tactic, and that, um, and that um, we're, deter you know, we're determined to act that way because it, it propagates our, mm -hmm. our life. And, mm -hmm. um, and he says that it's only by living in right reason that we can uh, live virtuously. And my question is that is there a specific way that through our reason we can create or yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's also Stoic, because remember that for Stoics the emphasis was on right reason in the sense of contemplating the order of nature and accepting our place within it. And um, Spinoza is saying ex ex essentially the same. Uh, clear and distinct understanding of your place within nature, 
um, leads to tranquility, virtue, so forth. But on the other hand, you are right that when he comes to talking in those terms, four and five, it does seem to sound more platonic than stoic, you see. Um, and it's that sort of thing which um, some have traced to the um, Kabbalistic literature of um, Judaism. Um, now, in the history of Jewish thought, you have some Jewish Platonism, as in the case of Philo, some Jewish Aristotelianism, as in the case of Moses Maimonides, and this Kabbalistic uh, literature was closer to the Gnostic tradition. At least, that's the way it's usually described. Now, the kind of Gnostic tradition that we ran into was um, the dualistic sort. But uh, there was also a kind of Gnosticism which had um, a hierarchy of being. You see, a, a unilateral hierarchy of being, such as we found in uh, Middle Platonism. Uh, they picked it up from the Neo-Pythagoreans who were influenced by the Gnostics, you see. Um, and it uh, fed over, of course, into Neo-Platonism. And um, it seems to me that um, this, um, this ingredient, if it, even if it is uh, the influence of the Kabbalistic literature of Judaism emphasizing love of God, First and Great Commandment, uh, the Shema of ancient Israel, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and so forth. Um, and blessedness is found in that, love of God. Um, that doesn't keep it from having platonic influence in that, even within the Kabbalistic tradition. Does that make sense? And, you know, you could look at the overall um, structure of his thinking, and you remember how I drew the uh, you, you could look upon that as sort of a hierarchy of being. Uh, except that, this is uh, where it falls short. Um, there's no emanation out of God to the outside of God. <laughs> you see... Um, uh, so that finite things are not something other than God that have over, sort of um, um, overflown, overflowed from God. Now, um, in Neoplatonism, uh, that's what emanations are. Uh, they are of the very stuff of God that has overflowed from God. <coughs> but no, these are modes of God's own being. It's very different. So metaphysically, it seems closer to the Stoic pantheism, though you get some ethical overtones that may be more reminiscent of Plato. Follow? I see some heads nodding um, with eyes wide open, alert. Okay, so um, then one premise has to do with